I like being able to introduce the bishop. This is fun. Uh, when I was in seminary in the late 70s, uh, Willimon was one of my go-to guys when I was trying to figure out who I was, who Jesus was, and what the church was all about. I was uh, on a search for meaning. He never disappointed me when I read his books, although I didn't always get at first what he was saying. I had to think about it, but when I did tune in and begin to enjoy his sense of humor along with his wisdom, my spiritual journey took off. And one of my clergy women friends describes him as fearless and wickedly funny. You like that? <laughs> what a compliment that is to him. I always have loved his stories, the ones that made me fall more in love with Jesus, and the more he talked about the church and what it was like and the challenge it presented, the more I knew all of us were called to this counter-cultural community. He made me see that. And uh, when he and his colleague, Stanley Hauerwas, talked about their very popular book, it was called Resident Aliens, and actually became the most popular book you've ever written, right? Is that right? Yeah. And it, it became popular, I think, because everybody, not just clergy, all the lay people in the churches, everybody read it. And I think there was a hunger for, from so many church people to actually get up, stand for something, make a difference, and wrestle with what difference the church was making in the world. We wanted to do real church, and that's what the book called us to do. Reviewers called the book provocative, and it was well received. My respect for him grew even more when I read his book, published in 2018, entitled, Who Lynched Willie Earle? Quote, colon, preaching to confront racism. In his memoir, which is called Accidental Preacher, and it's wonderful, if you want to read it, it's fantastic, he says he wrote the book after spending two years doing research because of a conspiracy of silence in his hometown. And he wrote it, he said, as a, quote, labor of love, penance, for being born in segregationist Greenville, South Carolina. You can imagine what the book is about. We live in Texas. His resume is unbelievable. He seems to have done everything and been everywhere. He says that as a child, he was not good at athletics. He was good at Boy Scouts and a few other things, but he spent a lot of time alone, and he discovered his love of reading and his love of words. And he wrote, and he wrote, and he read, and he read. He has written almost 100 books, all kinds of articles and all kinds of magazines, including the Christian Century, which is known by Methodist pastors very well. And actually, a Pew Research survey named him one of the two most popular uh, writers that uh, mainline ministers have read. The other one was Henry Nowen. It's pretty good company. Pretty good company. Uh, he admits to being a little bit compulsive, right? <laughs> and uh, Kate Bowler, a good friend of him, says that it's his deep love for the church, particularly the United Methodist Church, that keeps him moving at a pace that is inconceivable to most of us, right? Uh, we can't keep up with him. But he does not want to, to leave any stone unturned because he loves the church so much. It's his love for the church that drives him. So, he se Willimon seems to figure it out. Life is an adventure. It's an adventure with God at the helm. At the helm. And uh, I realize that he responds to the Holy Spirit in the way that all of us want to. We want to go on this kind of adventure with God leading that he's doing. And let's welcome Will, Will Willimon. So much. Uh, so glad to have you. Y'all have extravagantly introduced me. 
uh, today, and I am grateful. Um, the topic tonight was Stan's idea. I, uh, you know, maybe it's because at my age, although I must say Don and I are contemporaries, believe it or not, I've obviously worked harder than she has. <laughs> look at look at me. Uh, but maybe it's because of my age, but <clears throat> I really am hesitant to do prognostication because I guess, you know, at my age, you look back and I think about all the things I was wrong about, like beta rather than VHS. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Speaking in Vancouver a few years ago at the Episcopal Cathedral, we had a talk back session afterwards, and this Canadian uh, said, uh, are y'all really going to elect uh, that man, that, that failed businessman, that liar, that draft, are you going to elect him president? And I said, is that what they're telling you in Canada? That's ridiculous. Is that actually what you're hearing in Canada? No, no, how dumb do you think we are? And anyway, um, <laughs> two months later after the election, uh, the bishop called up and said, don't you want to come back to Vancouver and apologize to the lay people <laughs> that you called idiots and that they didn't know anything? So anyway, um, my I, I doubt my predictive capacities. <coughs> However, I, I hope to say something uh, that, that will be helpful. Uh, and I'm aware that I'm saying something in the context of this remarkable congregation. Uh, Lover's Lane has got to be 1-2 percent in the United Methodist Church, of churches of this size and this capacity and this activity. And, um, well, the time in which we are and, and which we have lived through, living through as a church, uh, I think is, is going to be remembered probably first of all, and certainly be remembered by me as a time of, of loss a time of uh, huge transition. Uh, I know I teach an introduction to ordained leadership class at Duke Divinity School, and I began the class by saying, you cannot serve the same church I served, <laughs> and that I work to my personal advancement. Uh, that's, I'm just sure that church is not going to be into the future. However, uh, there's another church being born because that's kind of what Jesus Christ does. And um, I'm leaving, you're arriving, and uh, I, I don't know about that. So, so this class is tough. I'm going to tell you some things that work for me in my time in the church, and I believe you'll find some of those helpful. Uh, about 50% of that will be wrong. And I don't know which 50% of it is. Uh, that's up to you. And uh, the students say, what an inspiring beginning for the class. Uh, but it's true. Uh, the, the church that nurtured me, that introduced me to Jesus Christ, that gave me opportunities for service in his name, that church is dramatically changing. Uh, and it feels like the change, first of all, is uh, mostly loss. And, and you know what, how we react to loss, it's called grief. And I think it's important to be honest about, you know, our grief. Uh, one of my former students called me after the meeting of the South Carolina conference this year and said, it was just wonderful. Said we all dreaded it. We, we didn't think it was going to go well, but it was just beautiful. People were hugging each other, and uh, uh, you know, the leader of the disaffiliation group came up and and blessed us all, and we blessed him on his way out the door. And it was just it was just beautiful. It was just 
I said, well, great. I'm glad y'all had a wonderful time. You just gave away my home church, 2,000 members, by a vote of 38 votes. I'm glad y'all feel good about that and that you're just, everybody had a love feast over it. Uh, I'm not there yet. <laughs> uh, so, so there is loss. Um, I think that the mainline Protestant, you know, North American church, that's loss is kind of what we're doing now and probably will be doing into the immediate future. Uh, I think denominationalism as a way of doing church, which is about, Ted Campbell knows more about this than I, but I guess about 200 years old or so, that that appears to be ending. Uh, I know uh, it's kind of fun. You get, get a group of people who say, wow, the Method United Methodist Church needs a revival. United Methodist Church needs, a, I got an idea. Let's all form another mostly white, aging, male-dominated denomination. Hey, that's my great idea for the future. Well, that's the dumbest thing you ever heard. You know, <laughs> no, that, that, that's over. And, uh, it, and to make a statement like that, that being over, just remember my, my father-in-law was a Methodist preacher. My wife's father grandfather and grandmother were Methodist preachers in South Carolina. Her grandmother was the first ordained United Methodist woman in South Carolina, 1956. And uh, anyway, uh, my father-in-law used to keep reminding me the United Methodist Church as a big denominational bureaucratic entity, ah, that, that's only about 75 years old that for most of our history, the, the general church was a meeting every four years, about five standing committees, and get together and sing and vote and all, and then go home. Uh, so just a reminder that, the, that what my loss that I'm lamenting is, is maybe, you know, has just been one part of, of the history of our church. Uh, I serve on the board of Walford College and, and I reminded uh, the board as they were asking me, what, what's going on among the Methodists and all? What, how does that affect the college? And I said, this college has served five different Methodist churches in our history. And uh, so it's that amid the loss. Uh, in fact... I think one of the sad things about the energy and the pain and all that's gone on in our church, larger church, uh, over the past couple of years, the pain is, I think most of that has been a sad distraction from the main thing. Uh, I remember early on talking to a wonderful church observer of the United Methodist Church, somebody who knows more about the United Methodist Church than anybody. And uh, I said to him, how, how, you know, if this thing goes through, how many United Methodists might we lose? And he said, I, I think no more than about, uh, he said probably about 500,000 or so, 600,000. I said, whoa, that's a lot of Methodists. And he said, well, you know, it's an eight million, eight million denomination, so, you know, but that's significant. And then he said to me, he said, the sad thing is, that's less United Methodists we will lose to disaffiliation than the Lord is taking from us in the same period of time. He said, isn't it interesting, we're having this big conversation about who might stay, who might leave, what might happen. And he said, in an in a organization where the median age is 63 years old, and in other words, saying, you know, our problem is not as we've often framed it. Oh, my goodness, we've got people leaving and we're dividing and people. The problem is you can't be an organization, a human organization with a future, much of a future, with, if your median age is 63 years old. Uh, look at me. <laughs> you know, I don't have that much of a future. Uh, well, 
uh, our church. And, and I tell you, sometimes I think we decided to split up and fight over, are you on the right or the left? Are you traditional? Are you progressive? You think, sometimes I think we decided to do that rather than do the hard prayerful work to say, what do we have to do to get back in touch with the three generations of young Christians that we have excluded? And what about that? Years ago, read that if you grew up in the United Methodist Church, the chances of you still being in the United Methodist Church uh, by the time you were 35 were like one in four. If you were an Episcopalian, it was like one in Eight. Uh, that's any comfort. Uh, <laughs> but, but sadly, you, you know, that's, you know, and, and a new denomination does not address, therefore, any of the basic challenges uh, put before us. We have unintentionally limited the church to the spiritual needs of one generation my generation, and, and now we're paying for that, and there's grief. Added to that, one reason it makes it difficult to do church the way Methodist Christians do church is the anti-institutional mood that Americans are in. Gil Rendell has just done a great new book saying that, uh, hey, Americans, particularly younger Americans, are really anti-institutional these days. They can't figure out why they need institutions. Uh, they, they are suspicious of institutions. Uh, some of you know that if, if, if you're up at the top of an institution these days, that's a tough place to be. Uh, people are suspicious of our leaders. Uh, there, there ain't much affection out there for those who uh, have given their lives to nurturing and uh, institutions, uh, that's tough. And as Rendell says, when people say, hey, y you know, I, <clears throat> I'm just not into institutional religion. I'm not into religious organizations. What they, what translated that means is, I don't like the church. The church is the way Christians do institutions. It's, and I think a, a, a particular problem for us is that uh, while it's not necessary to do church, to have, you know, a denomination and a meeting every four years and a book of discipline, while that's not necessary, because of Jesus Christ, it is necessary to be a community, to be a body. It is unknown, people following Jesus Christ solo. Uh, that's not the way he does salvation. Uh, read the Bible, read the New Testament. He, he, get, he gathers a group. This is the way he does it. And um, uh, I think that's a challenge. It's a challenge. And when we say, uh, well, you know, we have this attendance here, but we have a lot that worship online. Uh, I, I think that's, that's going to be a hard thing to make, is it? Because Christian, it's called communion. Holy communion, community, in common. It's called the body of Christ. Uh, the way Jesus takes up room in the world. It's an entity. And, uh, you know, if, if you're going to argue that Christianity is some, a little contract between me and God, a little something I do in my heart, just me and the Lord, uh, there ain't any... Biblical justification for that being Christianity. Uh, we got a challenge. If it's true that Americans are an anti-institutional, anti-organizational, unchurching time, I think we got a problem, and the problem is, is theological. We got a Jesus who brings people together. And, uh, you know, as a bishop, uh, I never had anybody quit the ministry because of Jesus. And you'd think they would, because he's, he's demanding. And, um, you, you know, no, the reason that Methodist preachers leave the ministry 
is you, the laity. Uh, they love Jesus. They just don't like his friends. And, and so, and yet that, it, that's church, and I think that's, that's a challenge for us. And yet, let me move to thinking about more, maybe more positively about this. It, it, it's the nature of a redemptive God to take our dead ends and our dilemmas and our mess-ups and uh, transform them. They, all those moments in your life, when all those moments when I, as a leader of the church, have had to go to the Lord in prayer and say, okay, Lord, here we are again. Um, we, it sounded good at the time, and we tried this, and uh, it turns out this was a huge mistake. And uh, Come on, Lord. Uh, we need you. And uh, it's Alabama. You've been here before working redemptively. Uh, we need you again. Come on here, Lord. Uh, uh, and so, as a Christian, we're never permitted despair. <laughs> I'm never permitted, because of Easter, to say, okay, that's it. Dead end. Nothing to be done. Nothing going to happen. What's next for Lover's Lane Church? What's next for us as a denomination? What's, well, there is a sense in which this could be a very short speech tonight to say, what's next? God only knows. And I mean that with the deepest sense of theological seriousness. The last pope said, only God has a future. We're mortal human beings. We don't do future. <laughs> Only God has a future. My hope that I live and die under is that the God who has a future will somehow, in love, bring me along into eternity. Uh, and yet, and, and that's a reminder that, that uh, one text that I've loved dearly in ministry is where Jesus in a kind of offhand way says my father's working and I'm working which means you're not the only one working uh, it's not all left up to you what might be being born among us during a time of mourning and loss and death good Christian question to ask and um, some things I've go around and say to churches, is uh, use this as an opportunity to have a focused, serious discussion around these questions. Uh, what portion of the mission of Jesus Christ has been given to this congregation in this time and in this place? How can we hitch on to that? Who in this congregation is already participating in that mission? And how can we support them and invite some more people to join them uh, in that mission? Those are the most important questions. And maybe I remember the pastor in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, who said, uh, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time in this church sitting around saying, why are Methodists so dadgum wonderful? You know, Methodists just don't think like that. That's the way we don't... But, but said, in the present moment, we have had to sit here and think, what do you love about being in this church? Uh, and it, it, it's been a wonderful conversation. He said, as a pastor, I've been surprised at what people have said, why they're here. Uh, the uh, I know it was a bishop was visiting a church and we were having a talk uh, afterwards, conversation about all the things wrong with the United Methodist Church and the laity were saying some things that they thought were wrong and I'm saying, well, I know more about it than you do. I've got a longer list than you have and I've published my list. I anyway, uh, and we were, you know, the conversation was just getting lower and lower and lower and this woman just blurted out, you don't know what you're talking about. She said, let me tell you. You don't know how good you got it here, do you? 
And she said, I was the victim of two demagogic, know-it-all, out-of-control preachers in a row. And the second time, I swore to God, I will never be a part of a church where clergy are not watched by somebody other than the poor, pitiful lady. And I said, wow, that's the most beautiful speech for bishops <laughs> I've ever heard. You're saying you're, you love this church because of bishops? Wow, uh, I need you to ride around with me for the next year and just give that speech. That's all I ask for, just that speech. Um, but you know, she was, she was right. Uh, she was followed, by the way, by another woman who spoke up and said, <laughs> I spent 35 years of my life thinking God was mad at me. And then I found the Methodist Church. Well, therefore I say to churches, spend some time asking, why has this church been a blessing to you? Why has Jesus Christ uniquely shown up to you in this church that, that is unique? Uh, I suggest, for instance, asking that question of your newest members. Put them on the stage here some night. Ask them, why are you at Lover's Lane? What, what drew you here? Because they may know you better than you know yourself. And it'd be interesting to hear how these most recent arrivals, uh, how they have seen in your church something that they desperately needed, uh, desired. Uh, and then remind yourself that we, we may not know the exact outlines of what's next, but we do know Jesus Christ. And one thing we know about Jesus Christ is he is Lord. And uh, as I mentioned this morning in the sermon, you know, it's, everything rests on that Jeremiah, Deuteronomy assertion where God says, and I think God says it with a kind of clenched-fisted determination, I will be your God and you will be my people. Didn't say it was going to be pretty, but it, it's, you, I will get what I want. I got a friend who says, gospel in nine words, Jesus is going to get back what belongs to God. That's the good news. And we work under that. He wants us to succeed at this. You're here as his idea. He thought of you being a disciple before you thought of him. Uh, he, you're here tonight, not because Stan said, you know, we're bringing these people in from the East Coast, and that costs money, and uh, <laughs> so we need you to show up, okay? Uh, no, I think you're here because you got put here. Uh, you're Jesus Christ's answer to, to what's wrong. And sometimes we need, I can't believe I'm speaking, here, Ted, uh, monitoring this uh, speech, uh, but say a good word for historians. Uh, we, maybe historians ought to remind us, uh, I, I've been fascinated today, just being here at Lovers Lane during the day, as you have recounted to me bits and pieces of the history of this church, the vision, that, that the sacrifice, the scary meetings they must have had, thinking, how are we going to pay for this? What? What do, we, what do we do next? Should we launch out? Should we do this? Should we, um, the, the difficult transitions and, and all. Um, the bishops, a, a group of bishops, uh, had a, we got a grant and we, we would invite in various people from industry and business and, and, and all to meet with us and talk to us about what it's like to manage a complex organization because none of the bishops had ever worked and, and, and didn't know how to do the job that the church had dumped on us uh, to manage the church. Anyway, we had a woman from Google, and uh, she was a relatively new Christian, and she, um, 
uh, we spent the morning talking about everything wrong with the United Methodist Church and how the Book of Discipline should be changed to this or that or the other and all. And she, that afternoon when she spoke to us, she said, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new here, but I would bet that I could demonstrate if I had the resources to I bet I could demonstrate the church is the most supple, adaptive, innovative institution the world has ever known. She said, name me one business here in this town that's 2,000 years old. <laughs> name me a university. It's, you know, this, uh, she said, y'all are amazing. It said, like the conversation today, uh, Y'all are busy uh, uh, criticizing, evaluating, adapting. And she said, you know, I, I don't think my company may be here 10 years from now. She said, it's technology. Technology is pretty severe, short life uh, in a technology company. But she said, you, I'm just pretty sure you'll be here. Uh, she said, you have never found a culture you couldn't work to your advantage. She said, before we enter a new market, we do a million dollars worth of market research. We never go anywhere we're not wanted. Uh, you, on the other hand, they say, oh, you take the gospel over there, they could kill you. And you say, oh, that's a call from Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and she said, you know how to translate your stuff into their language? It just... Well, it was kind of nice to be reminded, hey, we, that is us. And Lover's Lane, one of the great things going for you is you, you already know how to do so many of the things that I think are going to be required to do, be done in the next decade that many churches don't know how to do. It, as I was struggling with how to renew our annual conference, uh, it the Lord showed to me, you know, pick the 12 largest, most vital churches in your conference. They've already done 20 years ago what you wish would be done in the annual conference. Why don't you go to them and have them explain to you how they did that? <laughs> uh, you already are doing so many of the things that, that need to be done. Uh, I think one of the great watershed moments came uh, for uh, United Methodism when some people who used to call themselves uh, evangelicals, that was how I did, evangel they're evangelicals, you know, they take the Bible straight, they, they, they have heartwarming, they're evangelicals. Well, at some point, I don't document this, but Ted could spend a decade and figure out, could document it. Uh, but at some point, evangelicals stopped calling themselves evangelicals and started calling themselves traditionalists. I think there's a difference. Traditionalist, what's our job? Oh, our job is to guard the doctrine, to hold, oh, build a wall around it, hold it, hang on tight, hang on, don't, don't mess with it. Uh, uh, you you got to, you, this is, it's all here. We're, 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 we're preserving the tradition. Uh, it's a big difference between that and saying, we're evangelicals. We, we, we good news the world. We're, it's our job to tell the world something it can't tell itself. It's our job to get out there and mix it up and find out what Jesus is up to. It's all his world. He didn't die for the church. Uh, he wants it all. Uh, well, uh, the good thing is, it, it, it appears to me, from what I know, uh, be, be it Lover's Lane, you know, you, you've sensed, we're evangelical. <laughs> we, 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 we want to, we're Wesleyan. We want to take it out of here to there. Uh, when the church becomes introspective and hunkers down and settles down, that, that's why this foundation, this endowment, is so important is you're using that to help leverage your church out into the community. Uh, uh, this afternoon, driving out of the parking lot there, uh, 
I, I told Paul, I, I said, uh, oh, yeah, I said, oh, it's a beautiful neighborhood. Wow, that's, that's a beautiful home over there. Uh, yeah, that's nice. He said, we're tearing that down. I said, what? <laughs> and he said, oh, it's 12, that's where the 12 step goes on. That's not enough room for 12 step. We got 5,000 people coming through every month, 12 step, all kind of 12 step, eating, gambling, alcohol. Well, that's. That spirit is is what next. Uh, and I confess, I'm happier keeping church, keeping house with my church friends and people who talk like I talk and look like I talk. But uh, that's uh, that's that's not Jesus Christ. So as I was listing all the challenges we've got ahead of us, the death of denominations and the aging of our church and all. Let me just list one other challenge. Uh, our chief challenge. The, the one who makes church difficult. Jesus Christ. Uh, I come out of a church a while back and someone said to me, this is the most loving, caring church. We're like a family. Uh, when somebody needs something, we, are, we have their back. It's just, we love each other. It's wonderful. And I wanted to say, but I didn't because I'm such a nice person, but I wanted to say, I'm sorry. That's not good enough. Jesus Christ won't let you call that church in its fullness. And so therefore, maybe, I suggested this in the sermon this morning, maybe Jesus is busy taking stuff away from us that we love too much in the wrong way, so that he can make this all more exciting and adventuresome than it has been. About this time of year, when I was college chaplain, this, uh, these, these two fraternity guys talked me into being on the board, the, on the board of their fraternity. And they thought it would win points with the dean, <laughs> which showed how stupid they were because the dean was a lapsed Episcopalian and couldn't stand me. But anyway, I agreed to be on the board of fraternity. Well, the dean calls me at 9 o'clock, Palm Sunday morning, and says, there's an emergency meeting of the fraternity uh, board uh, with the fraternity uh, disciplinary proceedings this afternoon. I said, Palm Sunday, what? I'm busy today. I can't, you, you need to be there. You'd be irresponsible if you weren't there as a board member. So Palm Sunday afternoon, 2 o'clock, after two services in the chapel, uh, I go to the fraternity section, and the dean says, all right, would you tell the board exactly what happened at the party this weekend? <laughs> and the president of the fraternity said, look, look, uh, <clears throat> I'm as sorry as anybody. Uh, when I drew back to hit that SAE, uh, <laughs> I didn't know there was a K.A. standing behind me, and my elbow caught him in the nose, and I broke his nose, and, you know, it was an accident, and uh, I'm sorry. And she said, well, what was the body in the stairwell uh, with the white powder on it? And I said, oh, yeah, well, we don't even know that guy, and uh, he had passed out out there. Somebody said he was dead, but we went out there. He's pre-med, and he said he was still alive, and... So, but anyway, he was smelling bad, and so we put that talcum powder all over. <laughs> and uh, she said, uh, the marijuana, and said, look, uh, you know, uh, that, that was somebody's individual. To, and I said, all right, that's it, that's it, that's it. I've had it. Uh, I'm out of here. And I said, uh, this will come as a huge shock to you Philistines, but today is like one of the biggest days of the church year. I've just preached two sermons. I got six more sermons I'm going to preach before the end of the week. I got better things to do than to waste my time here with you losers. I'm out of here. I'm off this board. It's the dumbest thing I've ever done. And so I, I, in righteous indignation, I storm out. And on the way out, this unshaven frat boy leaning up against the door and uh, on the way out, he said to me, he says, nailed it. 
And I said, uh, excuse me, what do you mean? He said, you nailed it today. I, th I thought you really nailed it today. He said, uh, you know, Palm Sunday, I mean, what a lame day. I mean, what can you say on Palm Sunday, you know? But said, you know, once again, you found something to say. I thought, I said, y you come to the chapel? He said, yeah, yeah, like I'm there every Sunday. Uh, I regretted that promise I made to God the moment I made it. And uh, he said, what kind of preacher doesn't know people who come to his church? What kind of preacher are you? And I said, why? And he said, Lex over there, he, he liked the first Sunday of Lent sermon, that one you did on temptation. He liked that. I told Lex, so I said, no, I, I, think, I think today's sermon beat it. I, I think that. And I said, uh, <clears throat> Here's my card. Let me take you to lunch. I, we need to get to know each other. Uh, uh, okay. So I get out to my Subaru to go back to suburbia. And I get out there and slam the door. And I sit there. And I say to the Lord, you did that to make me look bad, didn't you? <laughs> and the Lord said, Let, let's... Let's, let's, go, let's, get, let's go over this one more time. Uh, for God so loved the world, not just the church that, that, that God gave. And then the Lord said, okay, you and your little church friends, y'all have a good time over at the chapel. Uh, I'm going to stay over here on Fraternity Row. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.